They're usually about eight, to be serious. Um, and I know it's going long if my notes are going over that. So that, that's <laughs> I try to police myself because sometimes they creep up, but nevertheless. Um, glad that you're here today. Always good to be with you on Sundays and um, bring God's Word to you. Uh, just reiterate what Mark said. As a quick reminder, if you weren't here last week, um, I did agree to or offer if we can raise uh, $250 two Sundays from today, right? Fish fries in two weeks, is that right? I, that soon. I think it's two weeks. Um, I did uh, offer to publicly eat a fish sandwich, which for you may not be a big deal, but for me, that's like... Um, Think of one of your least favorite things that you would not desire under any circumstances and then someone pay you to eat that. Okay, except the money's not coming to me. Um, actually, we will uh, help our friends at AIM, a, a mission organization that we love and support on the day of the fish fry. And uh, as I said last week and texted with a brother this week, I hope that we raise $249.99. And uh, no, no pennies allowed at the, at the fish fry. Anybody else not like fish, by the way? Any other non-fish eaters? Maybe we should get you in on this in some way. <laughs> if we raise $25,000, Nancy will not chill eat a, a fish stand. Would that, would that be enough? Okay. All right. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's transition to a time of prayer. As we do, uh, we, we pray silently. And uh, today's text is short. And um, it, it may seem like, well, it's just a transition or whatever, but um, God inspired this passage, and there are some pretty significant takeaways from this. One, and I'll go ahead and sneak preview this, is that Jesus came to preach the kingdom of God. And we see that. In fact, we've already been told in Luke's gospel that that was one of the primary purposes of why Jesus came. He came to preach the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? Well, we're going to talk about that this morning. But if that was important enough for Christ to spend uh, a chunk of his time doing that during his time here on earth, then it should be important to us. So if nothing else, pray during this time that the Lord will give you understanding um, and that we, he will help us as a body to also proclaim that message of the kingdom uh, to people who desperately need to hear it. We need to hear it. Others need to hear it as well. So Let's pray silently for a minute and then I'll close us. Our Father, we thank You once again for Your Word today. We thank You for the truth that Christ came to preach, to proclaim Your Word, to proclaim Your Kingdom. And so we pray now that You'd give us understanding as we look at this passage. Pray that You'd help us not only to know what the Kingdom of God is, but to embrace it willingly in our own hearts and pray that we would be about proclaiming, preaching, teaching that to others who desperately need the good news of Christ. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen. When a big event takes place, whether it's in sports or some big accident or tragedy or something in politics, you'll often find news stories, especially online, with the headline of something like this. Six takeaways from fill-in-the-blank event. That's, that's common. I'm seeing that more and more. I'm sure you've seen news stories like that. 
five takeaways from this big thing that just happened. Well, what's the purpose of articles like that? They're effectively communicating this message. I have analyzed, the author is saying implicitly, I have analyzed the details and the larger context of this event, and I'm now communicating to you what I believe to be the important points that you should take away from this, things that we should learn, because they may apply to you in some way, or they may impact the future uh, in some sense. Now, honestly, that's really not that much different from what we do in a typical sermon. Uh, I do try to show you how I got there, so it's not like my you know, magic formula or whatever to, here's Pastor Kevin's takeaways. Actually, I hope to show you that uh, I didn't just make these up, and you can arrive at those conclusions for yourselves. But in the context of a sermon, I'm generally trying to communicate, here are some important things that we need to take away from this passage. And part of the reason that I preach that way is because of passages like the one that we're looking at today. Here at the beginning of Luke chapter 8, we have this summary, this overview of a portion of Jesus' earthly ministry, His Galilean ministry to be specific. So He embarks on a preaching tour and He takes some folks with Him. Okay, uh, just a quick transition that we skim over, right? There's not really it's three verses, there's not much here. And if you were reading through the Gospel of Luke, to be fair, we might do that. But again, as I said earlier, these verses are a part of God's Word and they're there for a reason. We need to try to understand them. And in fact, what we need to do is look and see what are the takeaways from this text. Now, I'm sure you could come up with more, but I, I want us to look at four chief takeaways from this passage today. Uh, and see what what the Lord has here for us. So let's look at the first one. The first one is simply this. Jesus came to preach the kingdom of God. I said that a moment ago. And again, this is a reminder because Jesus has already told us this. It's basically reinforcing something Jesus has already told us out of Luke chapter 4. We came to this a while back. When day came, Jesus left and went to a secluded place. And the crowds were searching for Him and came to Him and tried to keep Him from going away from them. But He said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. In other words, I came to do this. So He kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. So in essence, verse 1 in our passage in chapter 8 is reinforcing something that we've already seen. Jesus said that He was sent to preach the kingdom of God. And here in chapter 8, we see that He goes about doing that. He's fulfilling the purpose uh, for which He came or which He was sent. And so, uh, I want to camp out on this for a minute just so that we get that. So we get the idea that Jesus came to preach, to proclaim, to teach the kingdom of God. A, A large portion of the Gospel accounts uh, is devoted to the miracles of Christ. And there's a reason for that. I I understand why the authors do that. In fact, John is pretty explicit uh, in John chapter 20. One of his purposes for writing, uh, he calls them signs. uh, Other places they're called miracles. In uh, John chapter 20 in verse 30, he says, Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these, in other words, the ones that John recorded, have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by and that believing, you may have life in His name. And so Jesus' miracles or these signs demonstrated His identity. They said, this is the Son of God. He is the one in whom there is life, life eternal. And so if we can get a grasp on that, Uh, It can change uh, everything. And so, again, John's desire was that people would come to to saving faith, so he emphasizes the signs or the miracles. But, uh, if we recognize that Jesus explicitly says He came to preach the kingdom of God, and then we recognize that verse 1 is kind of a summary statement, soon afterwards, He began going around from one city and village to another, proclaiming and preaching the kingdom of God, if we recognize that, uh, that then we see time-wise, he must have spent a great deal of time doing that. He, he, he's traveling on foot, most likely. He certainly weren't cars in that day. Maybe on the uh, back of an animal, best case. 
but most likely they're walking around, they're, they're going from place to place with the purpose of Jesus going to teach, to proclaim. And so there's a tremendous amount of time uh, doing that. And because Jesus is traveling from place to place, in all likelihood, He's teaching and preaching a lot of the same types of things because it's a different audience in each place uh, that He goes. It's not like what we do here or what I do here as being the pastor of a single local church. You'd probably get frustrated if I preached the exact same thing every week. Sometimes I'm tempted to do that, actually. Uh, it would be interesting. I, I would assume that at least some folks would notice if I came up and preached the exact same. If you didn't notice, that's very telling, right? Uh, I would assume you would probably notice. Um, and if you don't, then you probably need to start paying closer attention. But if I was an itinerant or a traveling preacher going from place to place, and we see this with uh, evangelists many times now, you would probably preach something similar over and over because you have a different audience. Well, what's the point, Pastor Kevin? Why are you saying this? Well, I'm glad you asked. Jesus apparently devoted a large portion of His time that He had in that brief three to three and a half year span of His earthly ministry, apparently devoted a lot of time and energy towards preaching and proclaiming the kingdom of God. But at first glance, you might not grasp that from the Gospel accounts because, in part because He was likely teaching similar things over and over. Let me approach it from a, a different angle. It wouldn't make much sense if Matthew, Mark, or Luke, or John just kept saying, and then Jesus went over to, to uh, Capernaum, and here's what He preached. And then He went over to this village over here, and here's what He preached. And it's like repeating the same thing over and over and over and over and over. But time-wise, again, a lot of time and energy was devoted to that. And so, uh, He likely taught these things over and over. So the actual time, the point that I'm trying to make is that in real time, the, the actual duration of what Jesus was doing, much of it was devoted to preaching and teaching the kingdom of God. So if that is true, then should we not understand what the kingdom of God is? And yet if you ask a typical professing believer, what is the kingdom of God, how would you define that? I'm not asking for an answer right now, but ponder it. What is the kingdom of God? If someone came to you and said, can you explain to me what is the kingdom of God? Well, you know, it's the kingdom. That's not helpful, right? If I don't know a word and I go to a dictionary and I look it up and in the, in the definition of that word, it has that word as part of the definition, that's not helpful because I went to the dictionary because I didn't know what it was. And so if someone asks us, what is the kingdom? And we say, oh, you know, um, it's uh, the kingdom. That's not, a, that's not an answer. That's not helpful. Now, I'm not expecting you to be able to recite some long definition, but I am about to give you one, and it's not the first time that you've seen it if you've been here throughout this series. So uh, let, let me bring up this definition here. I encountered this in seminary, and I thought it was really helpful, actually. Um, the late George Eldon Ladd in his book, Crucial Questions About the Kingdom of God, he wrote much on the kingdom of God. And this is what he said, the kingdom of God is the sovereign rule of God manifested in the person and work of Christ, creating a people over whom He reigns and issuing in a realm or realms in which the power of His reign is realized. Gary, would you leave that up for a little bit just so that way somebody's trying to grab that. No, I'm not... I'm not telling you to memorize this definition. But I do want us to understand it. Because if Jesus spent a tremendous amount of time in the time that He had here in His earthly ministry preaching and proclaiming the kingdom of God, does it not stand to reason that we ought to know what that is? And if we understand what it is, then even if we can't cite this definition, we can probably paraphrase it or at least communicate the concept. So let me go a little bit further than I did the last time a few months ago, kind of telling you what this, explaining this definition. And so uh, the first part I focused on last time, the kingdom of God is the sovereign rule of God. Well, it sounds like that's a given. God rules over everything. Of course He does. He's God, right? The God, of course, He rules over everything. However, in our fallen post-Genesis 3 world, many people do not accept His rule. Would that, that's a fair statement, right? In fact, many people not only don't accept His rule, they actually resent it. They, they, they detest it. 
They want to be on the throne. It's like I've explained before with the Burger King crown. I, I want to be the king. I'm going to put the cardboard crown on my head. That doesn't make you a king. And if you're an adult, it makes you look ridiculous. Somebody's going to show up with one next week or whatever. I won't call you ridiculous publicly, but someone might. Mark will. Mark, will, Mark does stuff like that. So how does that change, right? How does it change? How do people who by their nature and by choice are sinners who are, are, are bent against God's rule, His, His reign, they don't desire that. We want to be our own king. How does that change? How does God go about reversing the curse? How does He restore things to the way that they're supposed to be, creating an environment in which people not only accept his sovereign rule, but they actually embrace it. They want it. How does that happen? Well, it started with the coming of Jesus Christ. That's why the definition says manifested in the person and work of Christ. That's why Jesus at times in his preaching on the kingdom, which we do have in the scriptures, can speak of the kingdom of God in a present tense, that the kingdom is here among you. Why? Because Christ is standing there among them. You want to see what the kingdom looks like in, a, in its perfect sense? Look at Jesus. Jesus perfectly conforms to the sovereign rule of God. He's sinless. He embraces. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. That's the ministry of Jesus. So in Luke chapter 11, verse 20, we see Jesus speaking in, in a, like present type terms um, about this. Luke chapter 11 Verse 20, we see, uh, but if I cast out demons by the finger, finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And so in that instance, they're accusing uh, Jesus of things. And he says, if I do this by the finger of God, then you need to know the kingdom of God has come upon you. And he says it in terms like it's happening right now. And so Jesus speaks of this. Theologians call it already. It's already happening. In a sense, Jesus is showing what it's like for someone to live in the full and total embrace of the sovereign rule of God. But in another sense, the kingdom is yet to come. And the Scriptures speak about this. It's growing as Jesus creates a people over whom He reigns. How does He do that? He transforms them with the Gospel. And because of that, it issues in a realm or realms in which the power of His reign is realized, which will ultimately be realized in its fullness. And I'll speak about that in just a moment. Our brother came this morning and he gave a testimony of repentance, of how Jesus Christ is working in his life actively. And people sometimes ask me, how do you see God at work here? And I think many times, because of the influence of the church growth movement and other things, we're always looking to events, we're looking to numbers, we're looking to this, the, 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 the programs. If, this, if a bunch of activity is going on, that must mean that God is at work. My friends, I've been in a stadium with 70,000 plus people to fervently uh, cheer for my favorite football team. And that had nothing to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I loved every minute of it. I'm not going to tell you I didn't like it. I enjoyed it. But that was a crowd. And that has nothing to do with this. But if I read the book of Acts, how do I see the work of the Spirit of God? How do I see the kingdom of God coming? I see transformed lives. That's what I see. The Spirit of God changing people. Uh, Gary, you don't have this one. I'm sorry. This was a late edition. Acts chapter 19 came to mind as I'm listening to that testimony earlier, I'm picking up in verse 17. You don't have to follow along. You can just listen or you, if you want to. Uh, Acts chapter 19, verse 17 says, This became known to all, both Jews and Greeks, who lived in Ephesus. And fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was being magnified. Many also of those who had, who had believed kept coming, confessing and disclosing their practices. And many of those who practiced magic brought their books together and began burning them in the sight of everyone. And they counted up the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. The kingdom of God was coming. Why was that taking place? Because people were being transformed by Christ, by the gospel. They're burning the magic books. And those magic books aren't cheap. These weren't the pamphlets, folks. 
They're, they're taking things of great value in the world's eye, and they're saying, in, in, in heavenly terms, these are worthless. In fact, these are deadly. And so they're burning the magic books. Why is that happening? Because the kingdom of God is coming as they're transformed by Jesus Christ. That is the power of God, friends. Wake up, church. Stop looking for the smoke in the mirrors. Look for Jesus to work in the lives of people. That is how God is at work. That's what it means when the kingdom is coming. Sinners are being drawn to repentance. That is how we see God at work. I want to scream it from the rooftops. Don't look at, well, that church is booming because they're doing this and doing that. Maybe God is at work there. And I pray that He is. But maybe He's not. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers can draw a crowd. Jesus Christ transforms lives. That is the kingdom of God coming. And so, again, the kingdom is, is coming. But the kingdom is yet to come. Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. Uh, picking up in verse 25. I think, it, nope, not that one. All right, that's fine. Luke 25, or I'm sorry, 21, uh, picking up in verse 25. Uh, Jesus says, There will be signs in sun and moon and stars, and on the earth dismay among nations, in perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves, men fainting from fear, and the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then... They will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But when these things begin to take place, straighten up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Then he told them a parable. Behold the fig tree and all the, behold the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they put forth leaves, you see it and know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, recognize that the kingdom of God is near. And so he's saying, in the future, when you see these things, recognize that the kingdom is near. And so he's speaking of the kingdom of God in future terms at that point. And so even though people are being transformed by Christ, unless you're just uh, living under a rock or something, all you have to do is go outside, or maybe you don't even have to go outside, maybe in your home, you can see that everything is not as it should be. So the kingdom's not here in its fullness yet. But we've got something to look forward to, don't we? One day, all things are going to be made right. We looked at that at the tail end of Sunday school in our class this morning. At the end of the book of Revelation, God's going to wipe away every tear. No more pain. No more suffering. The kingdom in its fullness, my friends. Now I realize... Some of what I'm sharing, it may seem somewhat technical. Maybe it's more than what I do on a typical Sunday. But again, if the statement is made that Jesus was sent for this purpose to preach, proclaim the kingdom of God, and then we see in our text today that that's exactly what he was doing, I think it's important for us to understand what that is. But that being said, I want to pivot for a moment and ask a question. Do you gladly embrace the sovereign rule of God or do you resent it? My friends, that's, a, that's an important question. Are you determined to call the shots in your own life and live it on your terms to be the king or the queen of your own life? I, I'm going to do what I want. No one can tell me what to do. Or do you gladly embrace God's kingdom in your own life? Now, I realize everybody bad, has bad days. I have lots of bad days, so I get that. But if your attitude is and always has been, I did it my way. It's my way. My way or the highway. And you, you could say that's true even of the Lord. My friends, that's a dangerous indicator that the Lord Jesus Christ has never transformed you and brought you into that realm that He spoke about. 
My friends, Jesus Christ died willingly so that sinners could be forgiven. But it's not just that they could be forgiven, but it's also that they could have new life. New life in Jesus Christ. Where God is at work, people's lives are being transformed. And so maybe you're here this morning and you're listening or you're listening online and you realize, I've never had any experience like what you're talking about and my life surely does not conform to willingly embracing the sovereign rule of God in my life. In fact, I I wish that I was in control. I want to be in control. If that's you this morning, I would say heed the gospel call to repent and believe, my friends. Turn from your sin. Turn from your selfishness and look to Jesus Christ. Place your faith in Him. He literally is our only hope. There is no other hope beyond Him. Jesus told Philip, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through Me. No one. No one. He's it, folks. And I don't say that like, oh, well... No other way, just Jesus. He's a he is glorious. <laughs> There's much joy in saying that. Jesus Christ changes lives today. So have you turned from your sin and placed your faith in Jesus Christ? Are you looking to the kingdom of God in its fullness? Or do you resent that? My friend, if you don't know Christ, I would love to speak to you at the close of our sermon and point you to faith in Him. Let's look at a second takeaway this morning. Jesus did not minister alone. And so we're going from a pretty complex point, at least I think so, looking at technical definitions and whatnot, to something that you can look at the passage and just immediately, duh, right? Jesus didn't minister alone. Yeah, that's right, because he brought along these other people. So by definition, he wasn't alone. It's almost like you just went, you went to the steakhouse and you got this fancy meal that you can't even pronounce And then right afterwards, you leave and you go grab dessert at McDonald's, right? You get the the ice cream cone or the apple pie. There's a place for both, right? Excuse me. There's a place for both. So we need to understand these concepts, but we also need to not miss the obvious from the text. Jesus did not minister alone. Not that He couldn't have. He could do whatever He wanted. He's Jesus. If Jesus wanted to minister alone, He could have done that. He's the Son of God. He can do as He pleases. But for some reason, he chose to bring others along with him. He did not minister alone. He brought, at least in this instance, he had the twelve, that is the apostles, as well as some women, and I'm sure there were probably others there as well. And he's still doing that. You see, Jesus can do whatever he wants. He could, when you came to Christ, when I came to faith in Jesus, he could have just somehow directly reached you and transformed your heart uh, apart from anyone else. He could have done that in theory because he could. He he has the power to do that. But that is not the pattern that he follows. Consider the pattern that we see in the book of Acts, which I read from a a moment ago, which is basically Luke part 2. The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach, that's the title of our sermon series, until the day He was taken up to heaven after He had, by the Holy Spirit, given orders to the apostles whom He had chosen. All that Jesus began to do and teach is what we see in the book of Luke. But in the book of Acts, we see the continuing work of Jesus. Right? He's in his, he began in the sense that He had His earthly ministry. He's preaching. He's proclaiming the Word of God. He's working these miracles. But then Jesus is off the scene in the book of Acts. But He's still working through His Spirit and through His people. Christ did not minister alone in His earthly ministry. And that pattern continues even after that. Jesus did not choose to work primarily through uh, direct means where you just uh, walking down the street one day and then all of a sudden you're just uh, come to repentance and faith. Can that happen? Sure, it could happen. But generally, He works through His people. That is why the Great Commission is in the Scriptures. Matthew chapter 28. Why is this in there? And Jesus came, came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to Me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, 
teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. My friends, this is a privilege. It's a privilege that Jesus chose not to minister alone because what that means is that we get to be a part of His work. We get to be a part of it. You and I get to preach and proclaim the Kingdom of God with our words and our lives to a world that not only doesn't know Christ, but quite frequently is hostile to Him. Now you may say, well, that's your job, Pastor. Well, in one sense it is. But if we're talking more broadly about evangelism, then we're talking about proclaiming the Gospel, the good news of Jesus to others. That is not just for pastors. That is for every one of us. If you read the progression of the book of Acts, sometimes God used the apostles in mighty ways. Right? The apostles come, they preach, there's tons of response, all these people are coming to faith in Jesus. But then you see something else after the stoning of Stephen. It's quite interesting. Acts chapter 8. Stephen, that Christian martyr, um, Saul, uh, later we know him as Paul, it says Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him, that Stephen, to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, and dragging off men and women, he would put them in prison. Therefore, those who had been scattered, not the apostles, we were just told the apostles were left at Jerusalem. Those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. And if you follow the progression of this later in the book of Acts, you see that that, that, that uh, sowing of gospel seed bore fruit. And churches sprung up. Where are the apostles? In Jerusalem? They're not the ones doing this. So God is working. Now, I realize I'm not an apostle, but in some ways, the, the office of pastor has kind of taken that place in, in the sense of spiritual leadership. And the charge for the Great Commission is not to us exclusively. It's to all of us. And so we get to be a part of this because Jesus did not minister alone. Let's look at a third takeaway this morning. The apostles' training camp was the earthly ministry of Jesus. The apostles' training camp was the earthly ministry of Jesus. The, the, the book of Acts gives us these glimpses of the apostles boldly preaching the good news of God's coming kingdom. They're preaching the gospel uh, at, at great risk to their own lives. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with this, I, I would encourage you to look at the, the first few chapters of Acts and see how God used Simon Peter, a, a man who at, at one point in Jesus, er, near the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, actually at the end of the crucifixion, he denies Christ. He's trembling in fear. He's, he's cursing. All these things we see. And then later on, because of the power of the Spirit of God, we see this man who's been transformed and he's boldly preaching Christ. He's being used to lead others to Jesus. And then through his writing ministry, he produces uh, multiple books in the New Testament. And so uh, we see the power of God at work in Peter's life. But the question comes up, where did the apostles get the content for their preaching and teaching? Right, where, did that, where did they learn that? Where did that come from? How were they trained? Maybe they attended one of our six Southern Baptist seminaries. No. Not unless they had a time machine since the first one of those didn't come about to the middle of the 19th century. Or maybe they went to Bible college somewhere. Negative. They didn't have Bible colleges in the same sense that we do today. Now there were ways for Jewish young men to be educated in the Hebrew Bible, no doubt. But for uh, the apostles specifically, they were not educated men. Acts chapter 4 says this clear, clearly. Uh, now as they, that is the, the, the religious council uh, that was basically uh, trying Peter and, and, uh, and Jane, or John rather, it says, now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with 
Jesus. So where did they get their education? How were they able to speak so eloquently on these things? My friends, look back to Luke chapter 8, and you're seeing at least a part of it for months at a time, perhaps, over this, this course of time. They're going around hearing the best preaching that ever was. I, I can't imagine what that would have been like to have a front row seat to hear the Son of God preaching. I, I mean, it, it is outstanding, I'm sure. It doesn't begin to describe what that was like. And they saw it not just once. They saw it from town to village to town to city over and over and over again. And so they're being immersed in this education that Christ is, is giving them. They're, 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 that is, in a sense, the earthly ministry of Jesus, Jesus being their training camp. You understand what I mean by training camp? If you're not a sports fan, that probably doesn't make much sense to you. Um, when a sports season starts, generally, especially for professional athletes, you don't just assemble the athletes and start playing games. That would be a really bad idea. If you just brought them together and said, okay, fellas, we're going to pay you millions of dollars, and now you're going to just play these games one, they'd probably be out of shape. Two, they wouldn't know the plays or other things to execute. And so it would be sloppy. No one would even want to watch that. So what do you do? How do you address that? You have something called training camp. You bring them together. They work out. They get back in shape or in better shape. They learn how to work together as a team. NFL training camp even gears up this week. And so, uh, again, it's an exciting thing if you're a sports fan. And so the, the time with Jesus in His earthly ministry was like their training camp. They're learning. They're, 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 they're putting... The, and many times they didn't get it. Let's be clear. Sometimes in training camp you drop a lot of passes, right? They, they dropped a ton of passes in, the, in Jesus' earthly ministry. And sometimes you wonder why Jesus isn't like, you're fired. <laughs> I mean, sometimes it's almost laughable. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying this morning. I do believe strongly in education or I wouldn't have pursued it so long. I'm not knocking education. I do think it helped prepare me for vocational ministry. But what I am saying is this. If we desire to be effective in ministering for Jesus in whatever capacity that may be, then we need to spend some serious time with Him. Right? They recognize them as having been with Jesus. So do people recognize us as having been with Jesus? The apostles were with Jesus, and it showed. If we are going to be used of God in whatever capacity, we need to walk with Christ. We need to learn from His Word. We need to call out to Him in prayer. We need to grow in love and obedience. And when we spend time with Christ, it shows. May that be said of us, my friends. Let's get to our last takeaway this morning. And this is one that a lot of the commentaries focused on. They brought out, and I'm going to spend some time on this this morning. Women were integra integrally involved in Jesus' earthly ministry. Looks like an easy word, but sounds weird when you pronounce it. Women were integrally involved in Jesus' earthly ministry. And so along with the 12 apostles that we see there, the 12 were with Him. Look at verse 2. And also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Mary, who was called Magdalene, uh, from whom seven demons had gone out. And Joanna, the wife of, of Cusa or Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna. And many others who were contributing to their support out of their private means. And so these women had experienced the amazing transforming power of Jesus. And as a result, they go along with Him. They're on the, the tour with Him. Um, now, if you read that with modern eyes, it probably doesn't sound that remarkable. Jesus went and He had a group of men and He had a group of women and they went on this preaching tour. Okay, big deal. <laughs> but if you think about what was happening... And they're taking Jesus. It says that they were funding the, the, the preaching tour, if you will, out of support from their private means. But at the same time, they're, they're certainly gaining an education listening to Jesus as He teaches and preaches. Now, to the ancient reader, especially to one with a Jewish background, this scenario was unheard of. This was unheard of. I mean, like... I, 
You didn't do this. No one did this. In fact, I'm going to read about that in just a minute. Women did sometimes help religious teachers financially. But to be a part of his traveling group and to learn from him, this never happened. Listen to what uh, Craig Keener says in the IVP Bible background commentary. I'm quoting from him. He says, Women sometimes served as patrons or supporters of religious teachers or associations in the ancient Mediterranean. But for these women to travel with the group would have been viewed as scandalous, at least by Jesus' detractors. Apart from some small Greek philosophic schools, adult coeducation was unheard of. And that these women are learning Jesus' teaching as closely as His male disciples would surely bother some outsiders as well. Upper class families had more mobility as these women came. Obviously, they had some means because they were using it to support Upper class families had more mobility, but commoners might still talk. While a small number of philosophers had women disciples, many criticized this practice. This, is, this one really hits it for me. We know of no other women disciples among Jewish teachers in this period. This didn't happen, folks. This is revolutionary. In fact, many commentators pointed out the prevailing attitude towards women in this historical context is best conveyed by John chapter 4, verse 27. This is Jesus with the woman at the well. At this point, His disciples came and they were amazed that He'd been speaking with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek or why do you speak with her? Because they're probably afraid to question Him on it because He's Jesus. (laughs) But this is the prevailing attitude that would have been there and I think that pretty much says it all. And so at this early stage when this encounter with the woman at the well likely occurred, the, the, the disciples are stunned to even see Jesus talking with a woman. Like, what's going on here? Why is He talking with her? But they're too scared to say anything. It just seems uh, out of place. Now, imagine their surprise later on when Jesus says this. Alright, fellas, pack your stuff. Whatever you got. Not much, I'm sure. We're, we're going on a preaching tour. And guess what? The ladies are going with us on the preaching tour. It's like, uh, Jesus, can we talk privately? I'm not really sure about this. You can imagine that that would have not been something they were used to. Now, I could see someone getting nervous. Maybe you're sitting there and just wondering, oh, what is pastor doing? Is uh, talking about women and ministry. What are we doing? I'm, I'm not unaware that there's a debate about women pastors flaring up in the Southern Baptist Convention now. And my view on this is unchanged. I mean, for, for a variety of reasons that I won't go into today, I am a complementarian. I do believe that men and women are of equal value before God, but I think they have different roles. I, I'm, I'm not ashamed to say that, and I don't say that from some sort of uh, sexist position or something. It's just I, I believe that's what the Scriptures teach. Uh, the Baptist faith and message is clear. While both men and women are gifted for service in the church, the office of pastor is limited to men as qualified by Scripture. Okay. But the text that we're studying today says nothing about women preaching. Right? It doesn't say anything in there about that. And so I think if I focus on that, uh, we're really violating the text because it doesn't even talk about that. Actually, what it says is that these women traveled with Jesus and His disciples and they supported the ministry out of their own means. And so these women unquestionably would have been learning from Jesus alongside the disciples. They were welcome there. And other Scripture... Uh, which unquestionably identifies Jesus as sinless, tells us that nothing sinful was going on in this group despite what some may have thought. Despite appearances, nothing was going on in this group because Christ was sinless. And so what, what, where am I going with this? The bottom line is this. Luke, inspired by the Holy Spirit, intentionally tells us that women were traveling along with Jesus supporting His ministry. And my friends, that this is something that Jesus chose to do. This was of His own doing. I I contemplated that. Why did Jesus bring these women along? Well, maybe it's because they needed their financial support. We're talking about the same one who took a few fish and loaves and multiplied it to feed like 5,000. It's actually more than 5,000 people. If Jesus wanted to, He did not need anyone's support. Right? Jesus could have done whatever He wanted to. The, the devil tried to tempt him to say, tell these stones to become bread. He, he, he had the power to do that, certainly. And so Jesus could have done whatever He wanted. And for some reason, He chose 
to bring this particular group, which included women, he gave them the opportunity to be an integral part of his earthly ministry. And he still does today, my friends. You look at the history of the church from the first century onward, and what you're going to see is that women are and have been an integral part of the ministry of Christ in His church since day one. Since day one. I've said this on many occasions. I really don't think that this particular local church would have survived for 200 plus years were it not for the faithful labors of many women past and present. I absolutely believe that. And you know it's true. If you're sitting here and you've been here any, any amount of time, you know that that is true. We owe them a debt of gratitude. My friends, I, I know many of them are here breathing among us. I'm not going to call out people by name. I think that might be inappropriate. But we do owe them a debt of gratitude. If you are benefiting today from the ministry of Rikers Ridge Baptist Church, then you are benefiting from the labors of women in years past who served Jesus here. I've done some of their funerals. I honestly, again, I'll, I'll, I've said this before, I don't want to even say who today, but I'm just thinking back that one of the people that I've seen finish well, well in, in, in life, just to the end, was a, a precious woman of God from this church. And I can't tell you what that's like because I've seen so many people finish poorly And it's very discouraging to watch someone die badly. But to watch a woman who genuinely loved Christ finish well, I'm talking hours before her death, being with her and holding her hand and seeing someone finish well, my friend, that's gold. Platinum. Titanium. What's more valuable than platinum? I don't know. Now, in previous sermons in my time here when I've come to this, I typically start attacking the men. Hey, I don't want to do that. Um, Oh, let's start sweating bullets. Oh, he's going to start talking about how men are slackers. Well, we are sometimes. Let's be honest, fellas. But I do want to have a different take this morning. As we look at a passage like this, do we understand, men, that Jesus, by His own choice, welcomed women to be an integral part of His earthly ministry. So what I want to deal with is our attitudes. Our attitudes. I wish that I could say that Christian men who hold a complementarian view, like myself, were never dismissive in their attitudes towards women. But I think I'd be lying. My friends, that's wrong. That's wrong. Jesus willingly included women in His ministry as He's doing around. It doesn't say they preached. I get that. But my friends, they were an integral part of what Jesus was doing. So how do we see the women among us? Are we loving towards them? Do we take seriously the things that they say? Or do we kind of just push them aside? Do we honor them by not being dismissive when they have concerns or questions about what's going on in our context? My friends, we should be very gracious and recognize that God, by His intention, included women as an integral part of the ministry of Jesus Christ on earth. So men, let's repent. If we have a dismissive attitude towards women among us, you say, oh, that's, that's dated. That never happens. Right. No, it happens. Yeah, I'm sure it happened more back in my parents' generation or a couple generations ago, grandparents. But it still happens today, my friend. Are we willing to, to work and serve alongside women in our context without an air of superiority? Six things the Lord hates. Seven, right? You remember from the Proverbs. One of those is haughty eyes. God forgive us. If we look towards a woman with haughty eyes and say, well, you know, this is the men's stuff or whatever. Guys, without the ladies, we wouldn't even be here today. We wouldn't even be here today. May it not be said of us, brothers, that we had a dismissive attitude towards the women in our church. Instead, with holy love and compassion, let us remember that Christ died He loved these women. 
And he willingly included them in his ministry. And so, fellas, men, brothers, may our attitude towards the women in Christ's church be the same as the attitude that Jesus Christ held in his earthly ministry. He treated the women among them with love and dignity and respect. And he included them as an integral part of the ministry that he was doing here on earth. Christ is still ministering here on earth through his church. And women today are still an integral part of the ministry of Jesus Christ here on earth. Let's act like it. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for today's passage and for what we can learn from it. Lord, forgive us for when we resist your kingdom, your work in our hearts and our midst. Jesus came to preach the kingdom. May we, with Spirit-empowered ears and hearts and minds, receive willingly Your teaching from Your Word on Your kingdom. And may we love Your sovereign rule in our lives, even when it's difficult. God, we thank You that Christ did not minister alone. And that He's still working through His people today. Lord, we thank You for the work that was done, the investment in the apostles. Because out of their teaching, their writing, we have the good news that Christ came to die for sinners. And because of the ministry that You did through them and through others, Your church is still here on earth today. And Lord, we thank You for so graciously including this group of women whose lives were transformed in the ministry of Jesus. And thank You for the work that You're doing in women among us today. God, forgive us as men when we have a haughty or a superior attitude because of a difference in role. Oh God, be merciful to us. Would you give us an appreciation for all those who minister in our lives? For your glory alone. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.